Good afternoon, everybody. Um, great to see so many of you there chatting in the, in the chat box. My name is Charlotte, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Nigel Monaghan. So I'm a guide at the National Botanic Gardens, and um, Botanic Gardens and the Natural History Museum do have some interactions, which I might mention in a moment. So I'll begin by telling you a bit about Nigel Monaghan. So uh, Nigel is the curator, the keeper, at the Natural History Division of the National Museum of Ireland. He's been in that role now for about 20 years. Prior to that, uh, for 20 years, he worked um, looking after curating the fossil collection behind the scenes. And he's overseen a lot of movement. Um, there's been exhibitions at the Collins Barracks Museum and at Turlock in County uh, Mayo with the Country Life Museum. And currently he's overseeing a massive project of restoration at, our, at the National uh, Museum of Natural History um, headquarters. So he might mention a bit about that during his, um, he might mention it, but he's going to talk about art and the Dead Zoo today. So uh, generations have referred to the Natural History Museum as the Dead Zoo affectionately. And um, I, in some ways you can compare it to the gardens in that the gardens I sometimes refer to it as a living, or uh, sorry, a plant zoo, a zoo for plants. So we both kind of use that terminology to explain our collections. The gardens, of course, is a living a museum of sorts, whereas um, at the Dead Zoo, of course, contains um, things that are not living. Um, art is very important for both sites. So we're, we are both um, historical sites that are places of science and learning. And art has really helped us to reach a broader audience to engage more and more people with our collections. And indeed, for people working um, at the sites to learn more about their own collections, to look at them from different points of view. So it's really helped us to keep ourselves engaged as well, uh, as Nigel will show. So um, there's a lot of overlap there. And also even our very collections. So um, the National Herbarium at the Botanic Gardens contains our, our um, dried plant collection. So apart from our living plants, we have our preserved ones. And these were housed along with very interesting plant artifacts in the Natural History Museum until 1970. So um, we actually have a plaque on our building in the gardens to a woman called Matilda Knowles. And um, she was the curator of the herbarium in the 1920s, early 1930s, but she didn't ever work or set foot in that building because she would have worked in the actual Natural History Museum. So we have that shared history and, and heritage. So um, without further ado, I think I'll just maybe just to uh, mention to you, you can chat in the chat box there and it's great to see people um, having you know, introducing themselves. If you have any particular questions, do put them in the ask a question box and we will get to that at the end of the talk. We'll go through by order of popularity. You can upvote a question if you like it. And um, the question with the most votes gets asked first. So there'll be a chance at the end to ask Nigel your questions. And there's also a poll there. And we're very interested to see um, what you might answer. And we will give you the answer at the end. But during the talk, uh, Nigel might drop a hint in. You might be able to work it out. So without further ado, I'll hand you over now to Nigel. And I hope you enjoy this talk. I'm very much looking forward to it myself. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you, Charlotte, and, and greetings from the Dead Zoo. I'm actually in the Dead Zoo, um, although Ireland, and I can see quite a few of you are not um, tuning in from Ireland. We're still at high levels of lockdown here, um, but we do have to come in and check on our collections. Uh, we're very much scientists, and people see us um, under the skin, if you like, as a scientific organization. But I'm going to talk today very much about the artists I've encountered over the years. And having started off as a scientist, how that has to an extent changed my impression of art um, and also how it's changed my own um, personal view of science and art and how they fit together. And basically it's, it's coming to the conclusion that there shouldn't actually be much of a boundary. And in many cases there isn't. And some of the most interesting works that uh, we've been involved with pay absolutely no attention to the artificial science and art divide, even though in fact our institution from the 1870s was officially uh, the Museum of Science and Art, Dublin, although I do like the fact that the science came first. Uh, the science also came first in our history. Um, and if we can get this screen share to work, um, there we go. You should now be seeing the, the full screen uh, first slide of my talk. And I'm going to talk about various projects that have sort of impacted on the museum over the years. We are used, as, as most public museums are, to lots of artists in our galleries, sketching and drawing. And they're the more obvious ones. There are other people walking around thinking and planning. And uh, we don't necessarily meet very many of them. We do see them. 
Um, but there are 400,000 visitors or so a year to our museum. And uh, we don't get to interact with all of them. And people like myself are very busy behind the scenes. And it's a, a breath of fresh air for us, in fact, when we do have artists that approach us and ask us about projects that they want to do that directly engage with us. This is um, what I would consider relatively straight art. And I'm sure there are artists out there gasping and, oh, there's so many different ways to look at this. Um, but I'm not an artist and I'm not going to drown you in terminology and theory. Um, but for me, this is an oil painting of a dodo skeleton, and it's very accurate. It's also very pretty. It's a beautiful thing to look at. Um, and it is something that we have professional artists like Connor Walton here who work in very fine work on oils on fairly large canvases. Um, and this would be one of his more medium to modest scale paintings, but it's still a good arm's reach across. And to do this, we set Connor up with some studio space in our areas behind the scenes, and we brought the dodo skeleton and po posed it there and helped him out with lighting and access and everything else so that he could actually do something very detailed that took months and had a lot of you know, steps in, in the system for him. Um, and this is one of his finished versions of that painting, which I think is just, to me, aesthetically pleasing. And there's also all sorts of subtleties, and artists sometimes hate you pointing those out. Um, but you can see the ships arriving on Mauritius in the distance and the dodo fully fleshed staring out to sea, uh, not realizing that within 150 or so years it's going to be extinct and as are all of its kind. Connor also painted this <clears throat> giant deer antler set. And it's an interesting contrast for me because this is uh, an oil painting. Um, and comparing the size of a human skull uh, for comparison with the giant deer, this massive late Ice Age animal that's one of my favorite things, so I could talk for it for far too long. Um, but just to show you other things that people have done with giant deer through interaction with us. This is <clears throat> a children's playground um, and it's an interesting place to impale your children of an afternoon, but it's part of a, an overall installation in the school grounds. Um, and you've got a half buried in the ground giant deer, the kind of thing that I would, as a paleontologist, would love to find and excavate uh, in detail rather than dealing with all the fragmentary bits that modern machinery dig up. Um, this is a, a same giant deer. It's a replica. A direct physical replica made in bronze and installed by Paul Gregg, who's Dublin based. This is the giant deer itself. This is the skull and antler set in our storeroom. We have hundreds of these and uh, an awful lot more that can, than can ever go on display. There are about 10,000 exhibits in our museum. Um, that's quite a lot for a small space. It's quite a tightly packed space, but there's an awful lot more behind the scenes. And uh, this is just a view of one section of our stores with stuff behind the scenes in, in County Dublin. This is the same antler set again as a physical replica, this time in fiberglass. It's part of a reconstructed giant deer. And of course, with Ice Age animals, as with dinosaurs, people are always wanting to know what did the real thing look like? And there's a lot of science, <clears throat> excuse me, that we can put into that. Um, but a certain amount of it is also educated guesswork. And just as with Jurassic Park, you're sometimes dealing with fragmentary stuff as a scientist and trying to help people flesh out the whole of an animal. Nobody wants half a Tyrannosaurus Rex running around Jurassic Park. They want the whole animal full of behavior and activity. And often in, in the sciences, you don't know all the answers. And sometimes you have to be prepared to allow a lot of artistic license. These are other reconstructions of giant deer. The um, artwork in the top right here is by Ashling Adams, who was commissioned by the National Museum in 1984, largely done with Caron Dash um, crayons that are slightly water soluble and watercolor to produce this um, nice picture that was, because it's commissioned, we've said we want to see one of our giant deer in a landscape that matches Irish landscapes of the time. And we also want to see females in the background and we want to see juveniles. And uh, 
it's rare that you actually get to tell an artist what to do. Many of the most interesting artworks that I'll be coming to later are entirely from the emotion of the artist, and they nod politely at the science bit and take some of it on board and carry on to do what they are feeling, which is one of the things that is a bit different about some aspects of science and art meeting together. Here again, you're looking at giant deer. Um, animals have been extinct for over 10,000 years in Ireland and uh, are quite widespread as fossils in the Irish landscape. And Barry Ormond here has done a model and the coloring of the model actually includes information from uh, cave paintings in Cognac in France. There's a, a, a belly to the neck. Um, the front end of the neck is quite deep and that's because the bones of the skeleton when they're aligned correctly um, are actually not straight up towards the head. There's actually a curve in the neck which is part of balancing the weight of these massive antlers. There's also a shoulder hump that's not quite so clear. But what is very clear here is the color pattern on the coat. And that again is taken from um, cave paintings and illustrations of the last humans to see giant deer before they went extinct. At the bottom right is a simulation, a 3D um, digital model of a giant deer from 2001 that we also helped with. And this was part of a TV series on extinct animals. And they wanted to um, first model the animal accurately and then get it to walk in a natural way as deer would and then flesh it out and color it up and give it a coat and start to give it a personality. And it's a hugely intensive process and quite expensive to do, by the way, as well. It takes a lot of hours. Um, and in 2001, the programming was very different to what you might be able to do today. We also have um, scientific illustrators and people who come in to draw things as accurately as the scientist would like. Um, Siobhan Doherty is perhaps one of our most recent examples, but we have been involved with people who've um, illustrated the guides to identifying birds, for example. If you ever wonder when you're picking up a, a Collins guide to birds of Europe, who does the illustrations and how do they know how big the bird is and the proportions of the feathers and so on? They don't take that just from photographs. They do a lot of field work themselves usually, know the birds really well, know their behavior and their patterns. But they often come to study museum collections so they can get the details of the feathers just right and look at fresh colors from a drawer where the object has been sitting in the dark and not fading for decades. So Siobhan has worked with us um, originally with bees um, out of fascination, but eventually that turned into a series of postage stamps. And many of you may have seen her work um, through on post and they are beautiful, detailed. They all have character and personality as well as being scientifically accurate. And you really do need to examine these under the microscope and you often need to see them in museum collections to get examples of the different species because you won't just find them sitting around your garden necessarily waiting for their portraits to be painted. Um, one of her images has uh, graced the cover of the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. And if you want do one thing for nature today, particularly for the botanic gardens and for uh, wildlife in general, go and look up the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. And it's basically a, a program, a national program, to try to improve our wild spaces and well worth some of your time. Many of the artists don't talk to us, don't engage with us. They're here to do their own thing and they're totally free to visit the museum and do what they like. And you will find their work sitting all over the internet nowadays. Um, I know that hundreds and hundreds of art students have been through our galleries as well. And it'd be great at some point, I think, at least to have a virtual exhi exhibition based around artworks that people have done in our galleries. Again, this is, this is one that literally I just searched the web. And one of the advantages of a museum that's called the Dead Zoo is that it's reasonably unique and Google finds you reasonably quickly. And uh, in fact, if you want to go and follow us and see what we do on a daily basis, just look up Dead Zoo Diary or the hashtag in, in social media. And uh, you'll find a lot of what we're doing as our building restoration program. The students um, that come through the museum are often sketching and finishing their works elsewhere. I'm lucky because my daughter 
in her day. He was an art student, and I have this hanging on the wall of my office. Um, but it's probably just one of certainly hundreds every single year of art students who use our museums and are brought through by their teachers. And the one advantage with our wildlife is it tends to stay very still. So you get plenty of time to work on it um, and uh, then develop up your artworks when you go back home. We have had artists on placements, professional artists. Uh, Lara Scowler here from um, Glasgow has spent um, a couple of weeks in the museum. And she was lucky enough that at the time the balconies were closed and yet um, research visitors and special visitors are allowed into various areas of the museum that the general public don't visit. And she did quite a, a, an extensive range of pastel um, artworks on paper um, based on objects. And one of the things that I noticed fairly quickly is an awful lot of them are on the balconies where she was working but she was also able to work in the public spaces at the quieter times. It can be a very busy and noisy place um, when you consider the number of visitors we get every year. This is a, a more extensive series by Mairead Ohoka, and uh, Mairead um, has been a visitor to the museum for many years and has worked out quite a lot of artworks. And very unfortunately, one of the last pre-lockdown exercises was to go to the Temple Bar Gallery here in Dublin and see the exhibition on its opening evening. But unfortunately, it was only available to the public for about a week, but you will find plenty of that online. And you'll also find a conversation we had um, as a recording that we made uh, based around our different ways of looking at the natural world. This is again, one of the images that um, I literally found on the internet. Um, from another artist, well-established, Kieran Murphy, from 2010. And he has described this particular one as a hair with no eyes. And um, it's part of a scene um, from Norway, in fact, although it's on the ground floor of the museum and amongst all the Irish animals, and everybody thinks it's Irish. The main reason this display case full of tax, this beautiful taxidermy is on the ground floor is that case was simply too big to get up the stairs when they changed the function of the ground floor into an Irish only uh, natural history section. And it's got a lovely winter scene on one side with the animals in their white plumage. And on the other side of, of this very large display case with a different landscape painting without all of the snow on the trees, uh, but again, based on a Norwegian uh, landscape you have all of these animals in their summer colors and the browns and the reds and things that hide them in amongst the foliage, and yet they turn white in winter. Um, and it's a reminder, really, that nearly all of the major pieces on display in our museum are effectively artworks in their own right. This hair is not posing for a photograph. This is a piece of taxidermy, and there's vegetation, there's paintings usually in the background of these major pieces, these dioramas. Uh, that are designed to convince you of the scene setting. There's a lot of model making involved. There's artificial snow. Uh, we have old taxidermy books that include recipes for some of this stuff. Um, and they went to great um, lengths to try to make naturalistic settings. The family who did this, the Williams family, uh, are very interesting in, in many respects. And there's a nice book about um, Alex Williams, the head of the family, who is the main character here. But the young boys in the Williams family used to sneak down the stairs in the middle of the night and go hunting. And they'd be out shooting birds as dawn was coming up and they would sneak back home, get upstairs and appear downstairs in their pajamas, pretending that they were only just waking up to have their breakfast. Uh, they were very passionate and they knew a lot about how these animals behaved in the wild. And you've got to remember back in 1912 when this was done, you didn't have the wildlife TV shows. You had books to work from you had traveler's tales. A lot of the books in the traveler's tales were very unreliable. And really people who spent a lot of time out in nature saw an awful lot more and brought this nature indoors in our traditional styles of museum. Uh, Maurice Boughton um, would be one of the foremost taxidermists working in Europe at the time that we encountered the family first. It's fourth generation taxidermy family that started off in the early 1900s and uh, are still on the go and still doing top-end taxidermy. There's much less taxidermy 
being done nowadays because there's much less hunting, shooting, fishing and souvenir and a lot more photography. If you look at a lineup of, of natural history, people on a field trip a uh, hundred years ago, there's always a, at least one guy with a gun standing to one side. Um, and that is the ornithologist who's busy off shooting birds in order to get close to them and study them properly. Um, the Boughton family are one of the few taxidermy firms still working in Europe uh, at museum scale. So they're doing things like a giraffe, which they've done for us, and various antelopes. And here is Maurice posing with the sable antelope that's now displayed in the Natural History Museum here in Dublin. Um, known uh, to some of the staff historically as the stable antelope um, because uh, some of them weren't very good at getting the names right. They were also responsible for, the, one particular guy was responsible for our panda eating baboon shoots. Um, nowadays, the public, I think, get a much better scientific um, background when they come to the museum. Eva Walsh has done some very interesting work with glass, and this is actually a replica made from part of the spinal column of a very large dog in our museum collections. And by using different types of glass, and she's worked also in um, other types of glass, you get an amazing glow when you light these things well. So this is the piece, uh, Let Your Tail Down, Go Wild on display um, in the Netherlands, if memory serves me correctly, before it came to us. And with us, it was displayed parallel to our Irish wolfhounds that you could actually see um, the matching internal anatomy of the tail and the spinal column. She's also worked in um, uranium glass, which fluoresces basically, and therefore you get these wonderful, amazing colors if you do things in dark spaces uh, with ultraviolet lighting. And of course, no talk on art and our museum collection would uh, be complete without talking about our Blaschka glass. Um, I know that there are other um, collections of Blaschka glass in the world, but ours is the biggest collection of 560 pieces of marine animals. There's a very large collection of plants and flowers in Harvard, and I know there are people watching from there. And uh, the Blaschka family, the father and son team, did absolutely stupendous work. Not only is it beautiful and scientifically accurate, but when you show it to lamp workers who work in these techniques, they all gasp and most of them run away. It really is very difficult stuff to reproduce and they were absolutely at the top of their game. One of the things that we've learned more and more from the research done in our collections is that they are not just made out of glass. There are bits of paper, glue, um, wiring and all sorts of other materials. There is quite a mixed medium in many of these models. Um, these beautiful photographs, by the way, are by Guido Mocafico, um, who has taken the Blaschkas to heart. He's a professional photographer who does a lot of high-end advertising work. Um, but these photos were taken in the dark on a glass surface, illuminated from all sides. And uh, it's a huge bit of digital work afterwards too to to get everything in incredible detail um, one of the scariest things is our poor it department that gets sent images like this and then finds out that they are so big each individual image is huge that uh, we have an interesting challenge storing them which we are doing for the long term this is one of my favorite pieces of blaschka glass the original animal that this is based on is a single celled animal it's one cell they weren't known about until microscopes got really, really good in the middle of the 19th century. And this is a reconstruction in glass um, and with glue. And if you look carefully, you see these long, thin strands of glass. They're tricky enough to pull off. Uh, when you want them with beads along them, that's a little bit more difficult. When you want this many of them going through a cage into a central sphere that's also hollow and composite and very complicated, and the whole thing um, here, the actual original object is around about the size of a grapefruit or a melon. It's in that sort of size range. And it's incredible intricate detail that you see. And one of the most challenging things, of course, is looking after these. This was sent to us in a crate from Dresden in Germany and arrived in one piece. 
and Ireland is not that far away. They have been sent much further, and you will find examples of this type of model uh, in various parts of Europe, North America, and uh, even further afield down in, in Australia and so on. Various people acquired these at the time from these lamp makers. Artists are free to do what they like, and uh, many of them work in very interesting ways that I find rather fascinating. Um, this particular artist who's, who's worked with these, this is a bird. This is as, as we see it on our balcony on the Natural History Museum, taken out of its display case for a few minutes so that somebody can get a photograph. This rather bizarre and beautiful set of feathers that come out of the, the back of the heads of the males, because of course males spend their entire lives showing off so that females will be impressed, at least in the bird world. And here it is worked on by Vincent Fournier, who's, um, who's uh, an artist, a French artist, um, who's been based in Africa, grew up in Africa, and has a very interesting way of looking at the world. And here he has it without eyes, because the bird is concentrating on its precognitive dreams. Some of these things, as you can imagine, are a little bit surreal um, for us. But you'll also find work by the same artists nowadays in film sets. We've actually contributed um, raw material, background information and imagery um, and access to objects for various people who've worked in the movie business. So you'll see all sorts of things in the background of strange and gothic thriller uh, TV shows and so on that are actually based on museum specimens and somebody working for maybe months um, on quite an expensive stage set. Moving to photography, and you could suspect that maybe photography is the most straightforward um, of the, the arts, perhaps, and that it is capturing what the eye sees. But of course, there's an awful lot more going on than that. We had a, a photographer, Carl Grimes, um, who was based with us as an artist in residence for most of a year and uh, came and went and disliked the greenness of the light from the old um, natural daylight and the fact that the daylight changes every few seconds in our building as the clouds go by. But he plowed ahead and he worked his way through and took a lot of amazing photographs and saw things in ways that often when you sit down and spend time with something, you, you look at it more closely, whether it's a plant in the botanic gardens or a, a dead chinchilla with no glass eyes sitting in, um, a box in one of our stores and our stores contain about two million objects or so so there's an awful lot more than the ten thousand on display hidden away behind the scenes and his project organized itself it sort of found a natural order around the scientific structure that scientists use to name things you'll be familiar with homo sapiens it's made up of two words that's our genus and our species but if you're a bastard chinchilla, uh, chinchilla lanigera um, from South America, you have a domain, a kingdom, you're one of the animals, you're, have a, you're a chordate, you have a backbone, a uh, nerve down your back, uh, you're a mammal, you're a rodent in this case, and you're in the chinchilla family. And that's your scientific hierarchy. That's the way that scientists see you and the way that we organize and structure the world around us to make it more digestible. This resulted not just in a, in a project with us taking lots of interesting photographs, but also in a book with a number of essays and photographs from that, and a display in the Kildare Street Museum, much to the shock of archeology. span um, The Natural History Museum was closed at the time and we needed to put the display out. And there were stunning, um, fairly large size portraits of various animals. This particular one, the director didn't like because he thought it made the museum look too fierce. Um, but it was used on the invitation to the opening. There was also a, a major installation of uh, this, this work in the, uh, the Gallery of Photography in Temple Bar. Um, and here you have the dignified kings play chess on fine green silk is the mnemonic to remember the hierarchy of classification. And here you have fine green silk uh, with eggs of various large birds laid out but also a wall of little envelopes and bits of bird. And this is all from a particular collection 
of birds gathered up at Irish lighthouses. There's about 50 places around Ireland that used to have flashing lights in various combinations to prevent shipping from crashing into our coastline or running aground on sandbars. And those various people had not too much to do apart from keeping the light going. So they were quite happy to be involved in a project of late 19th century for a man called Barrington. And they would send bits and pieces of birds up to him to show him the different species at different times of the year. And that was the first uh, really good publication on how birds migrate, because of course you can see the waves of arrival, just like a weather front moving across the country. Just by comparing the species and the dates, you can see the arrival of various summer visitors and winter visitors to Ireland. This is what the collection looks like in storage. And this is just another one of the photographic essays by Carl based around this collection. Here are specimens of birds, complete birds in our bird study skin collection. Uh, we have about 17,000 birds in our study skin collection and quite a few of them came from Mr. Barrington. Um, whole birds, but never actually mounted up for display with the names of Salties and Tusker and the various lighthouses. And many of them were actually killed as they'd strike the lamp. They'd sort of come through gloomy, miserable weather and head for the bright lights in the distance and then suddenly find that they'd flown flat into a glass pane um, just before the light and end up dead at the bottom of the uh, lighthouse or the lightship. And many of these are marked on the, the, the lists as killed striking, which became the name of his installation. We've had other artists more recently who've worked their way through our collections looking for connections. Um, in this case, this is work by Dorothy Cross. And um, some of you may see an Irish political and, and, and historic figure in a beautiful little uh, um, miniature on the right. But I immediately see a shark tooth from Carolina, part of the great white shark tooth collection. These were massive animals. They put a, a great white shark, uh, they'd munch one up for a minute um, and have a great time. And Megalodon, you've probably seen them from horror movies and really poor quality sci-fi. Um, but they are stunningly beautiful teeth in their own right. And Dorothy Cross knows our collections reasonably well. She's worked a lot with natural history material in her own um, practice. And here she brought quite a few things that uh, came from various parts of different national cultural institutions, not just the National Museum of Ireland, but its various branches of natural history and archeology span and folk life and so on, uh, but also from the National Gallery um, and some works of her own that she brought into the space to share. I mean, here she has a series of portraits in a portrait gallery, and you'll see the, the pictures, recent and ancient oil paintings, but you also see a series of whale skulls because just like individual busts of human beings, each of these was an individual animal with its own personality and behavior and its own backstory. And it's easy to forget that. And as scientists, we may see them as data points and pieces of information and we have the ability to extract DNA and do other interesting things. But every one of these things was a living being that thought about itself as much as it could in the way that we think about ourselves. I like the juxtaposition of things in, in this particular um, exhibition called Trove that was on in IMA, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, um, because I know the insurance valuation on that exceedingly rare bird in the foreground. And I also know the insurance valuation on Roy Keane's photo because um, Basically, it was printed as a photo, so it's the price of a photo. Um, but the bird in the foreground is uh, has ridiculous prices because people have started to collect natural history objects, and some of the super rich are now competing with museums, and museums are never going to be able to really compete for what the super wealthy are prepared to pay for some of the very rare things in nature. Here's a, a, a contrast between our elephant bird egg and um, an oil painting from 1629 in the National Gallery of Ireland. And you can see so the simplicity of, of comparison of just a large, bald oval that some of us are heading closer to every day. Um, and the egg and the treasure of the painting, but also the treasure of the egg. This is an intact egg. It has never hatched. 
from a bird that has been long extinct. In terms of the way that people see the world um, and see the way that animals see it, we did a, an interesting project where the Cleary Connolly art practice um, came to us with this concept that they'd already developed quite considerably of beautifully engineered stainless steel helmets um, with optical devices like periscopes that basically allow you to see the world in very different ways. And some of them are quite disorienting. And we had an installation in the gallery where people could come and visit and try on the helmet. And with many of them, you had to literally reach out and stop them from stumbling because they were quite disoriented. If you're looking as in this case through the eyes of a hammerhead shark with your sensors quite a good bit further apart than you're used to seeing them, you have very good depth perception um, for quite a distance, but it's a very surreal feeling. And for them, it, for me, I, I see these as, oh, that's what a hammerhead shark is seeing. Um, but they see it in so many different ways about how humans perceive the world and how it's just a reminder that ours is not the only way of looking. We've done installations where artists have installed within our galleries. If you look at the right hand side, you can see one of our traditional mahogany display cases and in it are um, small paintings, but also created and worked on bones by Syveen Gibson. We've had quite a lot of installations in the galleries over various times, some quite short term, and that's come from art students and from other projects. This was one of the more surreal for some people in that these were animatronic butterflies. You can go and buy an animatronic butterfly in the top right. Um, and then you can put on real butterfly wings. You can take off the little nylon bits that come with it. And that's what Natalie Jeremienko was doing as part of a, a project that was in galleries across Dublin on robotics. And it was great to watch kids coming up and saying, Mom, Mom, this, this one's moving, it's moving. And the mother, of course, you know, it's a, it's a dead zoo. It's a natural history museum. The butterflies are not moving. Of course they're not. And then the look on her face when she realizes the kid is actually telling her the truth, that it is moving. Um, the ob object on the bottom left caused a little bit more of a stir because it was attached to the railings outside the museum. And it's a bird perch with a, a sound piece. Um, but the most exciting thing about it for our local police was that it glows in the dark and it's bright blue. And our prime minister's car is parked on the other side of those railings. Um, so it became a major security incident until we explained that it was actually an artist's installation. And our guardy just nodded wisely. Artists, of course. Yes, that makes sense. You can get away with anything. A few more things before we finish, just to show you um, a, a selection of some of the other works. We've had video installations. Um, some of these were actually during uh, works in the building. So we had our own dust sheets up and they stimulated somebody to make an interesting video piece that involved tracking down both sides and then project of the building and then projecting that imagery onto a cube. We've had people working directly to model and simulate nature um, with this cat skeleton that's a virtual piece and a, and a video clip. Um, it was based on this original cat skeleton and had to be cast. In fact, it was modeled, it wasn't directly cast. Um, nowadays, people are laser printing and then produced um, into a working version, if you want, of a cat walking across the screen. One of our security staff um, had a son who came in on a regular basis after school and went on into animation and, and is an important um, Irish animator in brown bag films who've been nominated for Oscars on more than one occasion. And one of their earliest pieces was working with the giant deer or the Irish elk. And uh, you can go and search for these things online, look for the last egg elk by uh, Brown Bag Films. And you can actually watch this animation piece that they created of this very um, pretentious last male desperately trying to show everybody how important he was shortly before he went extinct. Um, we've had more photography and video work over the years. We've been used as a backdrop for um, promotion of um, things, including this, this well-known Irish band, Bellex One, 
promoting their album Bloodless Coup. Interesting guys, with interesting, interesting uh, view on the universe. We've had videos taken in the museum space. This is actually a music video for a, an Irish bluegrass band called I Draw Slow. And we've had, uh, we've been on stage and TV, stars of screen with uh, Ripper Street in this case, um, where Elephant Man tries to talk down a, a suicidal character from our balcony. Uh, it wasn't high enough to commit suicide from, so they introduced a lot of extra layers in CGI and made a really nice, clean, well of furbished museum that I would love to really live in. Um, and this can make money for the institution, but primarily it gives you promotional reach right across the planet. Um, the Penny Dreadful series that was shot here, and uh, you should never trust a museum curator. Uh, I won't give you a spoiler alert, but he turns out to be pretty nasty and very interested in drinking your blood. Um, but shows like this have actually you re only realize the reach when you realize the millions of people who have seen our museum in a Victorian setting as a Victorian museum. And when you meet somebody that's come from uh, South America to Dublin and has chosen that as their place to come for their studentship simply because they saw this, you realize that even just the simplicity of our amazing backdrop is an attraction right around the world and makes you perhaps appreciate it a little bit more. Um, it's also nice to get their budgets. One of the coolest things here is actually at the top left where you can see helium filled lighting systems floating as balloons in space to get the right amount of light onto the very important people. They did ask if we could move the elephant skeleton so the former Bond girl didn't have to walk around it, but we actually agreed that maybe she could actually walk around it because it was just far too difficult to move. And we've been appearing also as words. Um, there's quite a few. There's Book of Poetry named after us. There are various poems here. There's a, a lovely piece by students in a Ballymun school um, based around a, a visit to the museum. And in our appreciation of art in the museum, we very much go by my favorite version of it. Art is everything that we don't have to do because there are so many things that we have to do. We have to feed and we have to do the basics and we have to get up and we have to go out when we're allowed. Um, but we don't have to do so many other things, but we choose to do them. And the Natural History Museum in Dublin, I think, is a great place for that intersection and for people to think about all the things that you don't have to do today. I'd like to thank quite a lot of people and uh, acknowledge them for their uh, time and their work and uh, their imagery here. And I'll leave you with a, a poem. I'm not gonna read it all out, but if you want to read there, it's a poem by Fintan O'Higgins. And I'll just read you a section of this. The hinges in fleas legs then, or the fascia of armored woodlice, or the spastic spring that sp spins itself in helical counter twists of muscle in shark or frog, the coil of nature, barely substantial, sustains and persists in solid flesh, in every blooming thing, in neural galaxies, in our behavior. Thank you very much. Hello again. Uh, thank you so much, Nigel. That was fascinating and very, very, very enjoyable. And lots to think about as well. And um, beautiful words there at the end. So um, yeah, just to thank you again. And um, just thinking about the gardens and our connections again, a lot of things came up. For example, Siobhan Doherty and the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. So Siobhan um, is a botanical artist who has also painted bees and so um, a scientific artist. So it's lovely to see those connections. And again, it shows, um, I suppose, our our aims overlap in that we're, we're all interested in um, furthering appreciation of nature and that can be done through art very much. So that's wonderful to see. Good. Um, so yeah, we have a few questions coming in and oh, the poll result. Yes, um, I think they may have got it right. <laughs> 16 people voted for 5%, which is correct, is it not? 5% of the Natural History Museum collections are on display. Mm. Yeah, so we got it right. Um, so that was, a few people might have worked that out even when you mentioned the numbers during the talk. So we have 12 questions and what we can do now is I can put them to you and I'll start with the sure. one votes. So um, the first one concerns Blaschka models, not surprised. 
Will Glashka models be on display at some point in the future? Um, in the short term, the overall picture for our museum is that we're steadily dismantling the upper floors because we've got roof work starting this year. Um, we have got promise of funding and we're working on a detailed plan for the whole building. So we have to empty the entire place and get everything out. In the medium term, the ground floor will reopen. It's currently closed because there's a lot of prop scaffolding in there that will be there until the summer and uh, people will be able to see the ground floor. It does include some Blaschka models. It includes mostly Irish material on the ground floor, and that will be reopening in the summer, but we will have to close again. So the longer term plans will be around what do we do with temporary exhibitions and so on. We've been far too busy and lockdown has made it hugely more complicated. We've been far too busy with the fundamental basic plan of getting the long term building issues sorted to be finding the spare time to do temporary exhibitions, but I'm sure that will be part of what we do over the next few years. What I would say is watch out for us online. We'll be putting a lot of stuff online. And I know it's not quite the same as visiting, but it does have a significant reach. And there is, of course, the entire building is online all the time. So you can visit all four floors the way they were before we started dismantling things um, on our website at uh, museum.ie slash NH3D, that'll get you into our, our 3D virtual tour. I think you answered a couple of other questions in that in, in there, which is great. Um, so yeah, um, moving on. Do you rotate items on show often with those in storage? No, uh, very simply, uh, there's, there's two big sort of general natural history questions wrapped up in that. One is that um, do you really want to see a different fly every time you come and see a fly? We have a million insects in our collections. Most of them are not on display. Um, so it's not like we have sort of lots and lots of different antelopes and which antelope will we put out this week. Um, the collections behind the scenes this are, are often quite different to the stuff that's prepared and mounted for exhibition. And we already have 10,000 exhibits. I'm not quite sure what else you want to see because it's quite a big, big chunk of, of the world's biodiversity in one place and a lot of very rare animals in there as well. And also it's a huge amount of work and we have so many things to do. There are five of us all together to look after two million objects. That's a fairly big tall order. And we're in the middle of a major building program that's gonna take several years. Um, so we don't, and, and part of the other side of that is I see it as a stately home of death. You don't sort of take down the, the king's bed from the top floor of the um, stately home and replace it with an Ikea bed because you think it's more comfortable. Um, so we have a limited amount of stuff and we don't spend a lot of time rotating. And when we refurbish and reopen, uh, our best ambition is that people won't quite notice what we've done, that we'll have done lots of structural and important work and it hugely improved the environmental control of the building and provided lift access that so you can actually get around the thing. Um, but the, fundamentally, it will still be a historic interior with that historic flavor throughout. So a lot of the same exhibits will be returning and most of the original display case furniture will, will be returning. Absolutely. So it's, um, yeah, that encompasses your priorities with, as such a small team and also um, the aesthetics and the overall what the museum is. Um, so moving on, there, is there a digital archive? If so, is it accessible to the public? If not, is it something that would be invested in the future? So I think you, you mentioned a bit about, I suppose that you can visit the place online, but I suppose in terms of the actual individual um, object. Yeah, if, if somebody has the funding to photograph two million objects, give me a call after this. I'd uh, be delighted to see them. It's staggering amounts of money and it's a huge effort. What we have concentrated on, we had five person team for almost eight years doing a basic catalogue of the museum collection. So I have that at my fingertips and the curators have it. So if you have very specific collection queries, like, you know, sort of how many Indian garials are there in the museum collection, we can answer that very quickly in a way that would have taken us days and we'd have to walk around stores and open cupboards historically to find out answers like that. So we've got a much better control, but no, we don't have imagery. Um, it will be part of the refurbishment plan to as part of the processing of each exhibit before it goes back on display to have photographs. And we now, of course, have this framework of a, a wet, of a database that we can connect all of that to. So yes, in due course, things like that will go out into the public domain. Um, but 
also people can actually come and walk and see it behind the scenes and many people do brilliant yeah it's quite similar i suppose in our herbarium our dried plant collection and our plant artifact collection so they have them all you know the botanists can tell you what we have um, but the, even having said that, sometimes there are surprises, I think, as well. Sometimes um, certain archives are not fully um, examined, so you never know if you have something, a different species in there. But uh, pretty similar. And they are working on photographing um, the collections, but they have about 600,000 dried plant specimens. So not as many as you, but still a large number. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question uh, refers to wax models. Uh, we have some of those in our plant collection as well. Can you talk about wax models? Is it special hard or magic wax? <laughs> Not much, no, because we haven't actually examined them in any detail. We have less than 100 wax models that I'm aware of, and they haven't been studied in any great detail. Nobody, We learn an awful lot from the experts who come and study our stuff. Everything I know about the Blaschka glass models, and I can happily give a talk for an hour, I've done it more than once, um, on the Blaschka glass models. Everything I know has come from people I've met and research visitors and experts and people who've written books and scientific articles and also visiting the archives in that in the case of the Blaschka models. And if you're very interested in those glass models, just B-L-A-S-C-H-K-A. -A. Um, the family was really clever. They changed their name slightly to fit in better. And because of that, Google only recognizes one and you'll very quickly find Blaschka glass models and there's some great um online resources in the Corning Museum of Glass in particular and also in Harvard that will get you a lot of background on those but the wax models no people haven't studied them so much or got so excited about them and I don't know much about glass model processing right so lots more to discover um who did all the taxidermy so I think over the years so you did mention a couple of of the people involved uh William and son and and um the more contemporary gentleman as well you had in the picture Yes, uh, we've. it's one of the things that we have spent a bit more time, I personally spend quite a bit of time, is trying to get on behind the story, the sort of social history stories behind some of our, our prime mm -hmm. objects in, in the museum, and also the um, taxidermists and the other people who never get mentioned, because the museum historically was a museum for gentlemen of the Royal Dublin Society. And I use that gentleman advisedly. I'm sure it was mostly men. They certainly made all the decisions and did whatever they did. And they were the people out sending objects back from various corners of the British Empire that some of them ended up in to the museum in Dublin. Um, and their names are always recorded. It, it's not usually well recorded where they got the stuff or more about it. So that's that can be frustrating for the scientists' uh, perspective. Um, but one of the things that was absolutely never recorded was the chap who did work for money good God, we can't have them being mentioned in the museum. So their names don't appear on the labels, but we do have um, accounts, we um, commercial accounts, where we can see money that was paid to people for taxidermy. We do have letters and correspondence that sometimes allows us to track right down exactly where a particular thing came from. And that's something that we have the resources to do. It just takes a lot of time to research all of that and then feed our database with the little nuggets that you trip over from time to time. But there were... Uh, we ex used taxidermists in London, a number of different companies in London, um, also in Liverpool, and we bought quite a lot of stuff in the late 19th century when we became a state museum in the 1870s. That's when we could afford to buy Blaschka models. That's why we had so much money. Uh, we had a British Empire checkbook sitting on the desk where I am now, and that gave a lot of power to people at a time when natural history museums and specialist suppliers were producing a lot of good stuff. Very good. Yeah, again, parallels to the gardens, the Royal Dublin Society established the Botanic Gardens as well. And um, a lot of interesting work going into our, into our collections as well, looking at mm -hmm. exact provenance of some of the collections. So this plant hunter may have overseen the operation, but who actually collected these specimens, things like that. Um, so next one, are there many reconstructions at National Museum of Ireland or are the majority of objects on display from specimens as collected? Basically, it depends on the group of animals involved. If you're looking at shells, they're the shell from the beach that somebody picked up and there's virtually no change. The insects are dried out. Um, the there are, Most of the taxidermy is one off scientific pieces. So they're, they're not so much like those hairs in the snowy landscape 
there's a handful of examples of really nice um, dioramas, sort of scene setting pieces of taxidermy. Most of them are individual specimens. And sometimes it's only when you get them out of the display case and stand them on their own that you realize how good they are because they're crammed in literally like sardines into a lot of our exhibits. Um, but basically, you're looking at the original fur and feathers and so on. And we don't have um, replica skeleton dinosaurs like you'd see in an awful lot of museums. There's a few categories of stuff that we have behind the scenes that really doesn't get a show at all that used to live in other neighboring buildings, particularly our fossil collections and our general geology collections. Uh, but most of what you see in our exhibition spaces is partial remains of real animals. Very good. And um, there's a question about the giant deer. And we do have a giant deer skull in the visitor center in the Botanic Gardens, actually. Um, we get a lot of comments on it uh, around Christmas time. Sometimes children point it out and exclaim, there's Rudolph. <laughs> um, well, we actually had a kid who walked in past me with her mother once and looked up at the giant deer and went, oh, now I know how they fly. Oh, OK. So, you know, we see things in certain ways. Kids are great. I always they're prefer their good. way of seeing the world. They do inspire us as well. <laughs> so this question is, if a specimen such as a giant deer or similar is found, is there an obligation to hand it over to the NMI? Just thinking of the implications of such finds being so expensive for museums compared to super rich collectors. Basically, there isn't an obligation. There's a lot of archaeological legislation. So if you find archaeological objects, anything with human connections. But in Ireland, that largely goes back about 10,000 years, time-wise, in terms of the, the first humans appearing here in any numbers. Um, so archaeological objects are very well controlled here. But in terms of wildlife generally, you're down and uh, fossils like giant deer, it's very much an issue for land ownership. So it's a case of who owns the land, owns what's underneath it. And that's reasonably straightforward for most of Ireland. It's not exclusively everywhere, but it's straightforward for most of Ireland that if you're a farmer and you're doing a drainage ditch and you encounter a giant deer, um, it's down to talking to the farmer. And many of them are very keen to give us stuff that we explain to them, yes, there is a potential commercial value. They don't find whole skeletons with beautiful, complete sets of antlers. If they do, they could sell them and they have done one or two of those have been sold. But for the most part, that kind of stuff comes into us because we're a state institution and people see the value of giving it to us. That's great. Yeah, our, our um, skull, uh, Irish giant deer skull came from Kilmacara, which is our sister botanic garden. So it was mm -hmm. uh, Dacton's property and they would have passed it on to, I guess, it was part of, hmm, I'm not exactly sure, did it go directly to us? I must check that mm -hmm. out. Um, so there's a question about dinosaurs. Do you have pictures of dinosaur skeletons? Nope. Um, we, we have a, an artwork collection and we also collect historic objects on our side of the house. Uh, sort of, so we have collections, microscopes, old scientific equipment, and we have artworks by modern artists, but also going back as far as the 1830s on natural history topics. Um, but it's not something we actively collect and we don't cover dinosaurs. Basically, ours is our museum historically is basically a zoology gallery. And um, we don't have a paleontology gallery that was demolished in the 1960s to make way for a restaurant for our neighbors who happen to be the Irish Parliament. So you don't argue with that. We have plans long term to develop galleries in our Collins Barracks site, which is much larger and has more space. Um, once we can get funding for that, we'd be very keen to do it. But Right now, we're dismantling our old Natural History Museum and working in great detail on the plans to get it back together in a much better way. Great, yeah. As far as I know, there haven't been many dinosaurs found in Ireland, although there was some recently, I believe. In, in There's a few scrappy pieces that prove that dinosaurs existed and they occasionally traveled in this direction. But at the time that dinosaurs were around, most of Ireland was underwater yeah. and dinosaurs didn't live in the sea. So what we're dealing with is, is pieces of, of animals that were washed out um, to sea a short distance and then ended up on the seafloor. So there's a few examples. There are examples of rocks of the right ages and animals that lived in the ocean at the times, but not really dinosaurs. It's not what we're famous for. So we use the giant deer as our dinosaur. It's doing yeah. quite well. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, have our niche. <laughs> um, will there be recording available? Yes, there will. It will be on YouTube within about an hour or two, hopefully. Um, is the museum currently sponsoring an artist an artist residency? No, 
because we're currently working flat out to dismantle what the artist might want to see. If you want to, and also we have COVID issues, we have a separate, um, the National Museum of Ireland overall has advertised an artist in residence. So if you go and check that out, um, but it's very much got a, a slant around history and social history and so on. Um, I can see it happening in future, but there's just far too many things to do in the average day. Of course, so hopefully. And the volunteer opportunities would fall under the same, that, that question would fall under the same kind of um, the similar answer. Yeah, we've we've had a lot of volunteer help over the years. It's been enormously useful. Um, it's in abeyance completely at the moment because of a ruling that dictates that if somebody works, they must be paid minimum wage. And until that general issue for students across Ireland trying to do placements is sorted out, there's no volunteering in any of the National Museum sites at the moment. Yeah, hopefully down the line though. Um, thinking biocentrically, are there humans included in the collection? So that's, that's a good one. There's a small number and one of my favorite uh, complaint cards, uh, sadly not signed like some of the best ones aren't, yeah. uh, was stop killing humans. And uh, I haven't, I'm not going to stop killing them because I've never done one yet. Um, time will tell. But there's a very small number of human remains on display. There's a human remains policy on the National Museum website if you want to go and see what our policy is generally about human remains. Mm -hmm. um, and we have two human skeletons and a couple of genuine human skulls and no provenance at all. Um, you could, sadly, you could buy a real genuine human skeleton for a pound or two a hundred years ago. Uh, they're seen very differently today and we are not as you may imagine, actively acquiring human remains. Yeah. And actually, of course, the Archaeology Museum has human remains as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a really good exhibition when the Kildare Street Archaeology Museum is reopened uh, in the next month or two, uh, whenever that lockdown level is agreed. And they have yes. bog bodies and they also have human burials and cremations. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I do think someone was asking when, when you will be open again. I think we kind of covered that in terms of all the work that you're doing aside from COVID regulation. I'd say the summer and yeah, Irish people okay. know that that's a fairly interesting concept weather wise, but yeah. we'll find out. We'll be told when we're ready. Great, great. Well, we're looking forward to that day and we'll, I hope a lot of people will follow the museum and the Botanic Gardens online. And in terms of following the museum, hopefully you will we'll we'll know when it's when you're ready to open again. Someone asked in the, in the general chat, they mentioned fossils. Um, you have a fossil collection. And I thought maybe it'd be nice to finish with, with that, seeing as you looked after the fossils. You were the keeper, the fossil curator for many, many years. Yeah, I, I was the paleontology curator from 1981. And the day before my interview, I had a quick run around the museum and I couldn't see very many fossils. So I didn't think there'd be an awful lot to do. And then somebody broke the news to me at the interview and shortly afterwards when I got the job, Oh, you think there's none? Um, we have a warehouse full of them for you. So there were um, something in the region of 600 crates of them behind the scenes that have been packed away for decades. And that became my job. So th there's some really cool fossils behind the scenes. Um, we have a, a large pliosaur, sort of think Loch, Ness, Lex, think Loch Ness monster kind of body plan of a genuine Jurassic giant that is 21 feet, seven meters long. Um, that's one of our cooler ones. We've got a saber-toothed cat sitting in a box since 1907, waiting to be put together. And uh, we've got a lot of really nice fossils, not just from Ireland, but from other parts of the world in storage in our in our museum collections. And as I say, that's that would be the ambition years on, way after I'm retired, that there'd be a gallery in the Collins Barracks complex um, where you could actually see some of those things long-term yeah. in, in a long-term museum setting. That'd be fantastic. And in the meantime, there has been the odd pop-up exhibition. Um, like we had the Devonian plant fossils in the Botanic Gardens a couple of years ago. So you never know, there might be more chances even before the Collins Barracks um, complex is ready to show them in other settings. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we'll continue to work together, the Botanic Gardens and the National Museum of Natural History. So I think I'll just, I'll, I'll, let, I'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much again. Um, I know that just looking at the comments, a lot of um, great um, feedback there. People really enjoyed this. And this talk will be available on YouTube so people can watch it again and they can share it with people and other people will find us, I'm sure, as well. So um, any anything you'd like to conclude with? Oh, just to thank you for the opportunity. And uh, one of the 
things that has changed our planet generally is how many people can come and join us from all over the place and come and come to talks. It's really great. It used to be quite a limited audience in a physical space. And it's great to be able to be out there more and to reach a much wider audience that can also watch it back at a later stage. So hopefully more and more people will hear more about us and we'll reach bigger audiences than our physical footprint audience. I hope so too. So thank you everybody. And uh, thanks to our audience. Thanks for all the great questions. And hopefully you'll join us again for more of our talks. Uh, we have one next week from Maria Long, an ecologist who is specializing in grassland ecology. So her talk is entitled Hidden in Plain Sight. So, um, you know, our talks range a little bit in, in, in what they address, but um, they're all connected. Um, they're all to do with appreciating nature, I think. So, again, uh, we hope that you stay in touch. So thank you, everybody. And have thank a you all. Goodbye. Bye.